de él. Buenos días. <laughs> señores y señores, and that is all the uh, Spanish I'm going to be able to offer this morning. Uh, I'm going to try to, uh, to give you an idea of what's happening in the internet today and what we can anticipate in the future. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that many of you are students of electrical engineering and computer science to, and to also take advantage of the faculty that are here to suggest some research that needs to be done to help the internet continue to expand. I want to uh, uh, confirm that Google is very interested in hiring people who are skilled in computer science and electrical engineering because many of the problems that we face at Google are rooted in those technologies. But let me start out by explaining my title at Google. I'm the Internet's chief Internet evangelist. And uh, on the, my first day of work, I thought I should wear something that had an ecclesiastical look to it. So these are the formal academic robes of the University of the Balearic Islands. I got an honorary degree from them some years ago, and they let me keep the, uh, the robes. And you don't get to wear this sort of thing very often, uh, usually only at a, an academic event, uh, maybe the graduation or commencement exercises. So I thought I could wear this on my first day of work at Google. And uh, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of the company, took this picture. Now, today I'm just dressed in my usual three-piece suit. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what has happened to the Internet in the last 10 years. If I were here in 1997, I would be quite excited to tell you that there were 50 million users of the Internet, and there were 22 and a half million servers on the network that were doing email or, uh, or World Wide Web. But today, as you can see, there are more than 1 billion users on the Internet almost over 400 million servers on the network. And of course, there are laptops and desktops and personal digital assistants, which probably add another 500 million devices to the network. In the same period of time, that 10-year period, the telephone system has evolved as well. Today, there are 3.6 billion telephone terminations, of which 2.5 billion are mobiles. And I know sometimes it feels like all of them are right here in Buenos Aires. But it is very important for those of us who are interested in the Internet to be aware of the mobile revolution. Because for many people in the world, the first introduction to the internet will actually be through their mobiles and not through a laptop or a desktop computer. So companies like Google and others that provide services through the internet are uh, very focused on providing their services through mobiles as well as through the traditional desk and laptop computers. I thought you'd be interested to see how this all started. In December of 1969, there were four nodes of a network called the ARPANET, which was the predecessor to the Internet. ARPANET was sponsored by the American Defense Department. They were interested in figuring out whether they could allow computer science departments that they were supporting to share their computing resources with each other. I was a graduate student at UCLA in 1969, and I wrote the software that connected the Sigma 7 computer to the first node of the ARPANET. And uh, at the time, I don't think we had any idea what was going to happen as a result of building this uh, very simple four computer network. Let's see if we here now. And it's important for you to know that the ARPANET was only one of the networks that caused us to think that we should design an internet. The second one 
was a mobile network that was designed to deliver between 100 and 400 kilobit per second data transfers over the radio. We built a radio network in the San Francisco Bay Area. A company called SRI International was responsible for assembling that network. And in order to test it, they built this very nondescript looking packet radio van. Uh, it didn't have any markings on it at all. It was filled with radio equipment, computer equipment, uh, and a, uh, you can see at the very top uh, up here a, 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 what's called a stacked dipole array. There were four antennas stacked up on top of each other. And they would drive around in the Bay Shore area near San Francisco uh, testing this system. In fact, one day, um, the driver, who was an engineer, pulled off to the side of the uh, highway and got out of the, of the cab and went around to the back to join the rest of his colleagues. And they were working to measure how many packets per second they could transmit and what happened when the cars went by and there was, it'd be what shot noise coming from the generators that were interfering with the radio transmissions. So they were working away to try to analyze the performance of the system. And a police car came by and noticed that there was no one in the cab and they couldn't tell what this big truck was all about. So the policeman went over and knocked on the door of the back and it opened up and there were all those geeky looking guys with beards and computers and radios and he looks in and he says, who are you? And they said, oh, we work for the government. <laughs> and he looks at them and he says, which government? <laughs> but officer, we were only going 50 kilobits per second. <laughs> so the packet radio network was uh, a test to see whether we could do packet switching with radios. And if you're thinking from the Defense Department point of view, this was to help figure out whether we could use computers in command and control in a mobile environment. Well, it doesn't stop there because if you have ships at sea that have to communicate using computers, you need to link them together. And you can't use cable to do that because the ships move around and the cables get tied up into knots. So you use satellite to go from ship to ship and from ship to shore. This system had multiple ground stations and they were all competing with each other to share a common satellite channel. So it was really an ethernet in the sky. That was the third network that used packet switching. They were all very different. Their speeds were different. The delays were different, like the satellite system took one quarter of a second to go up and down at synchronous uh, altitudes. The packet sizes were different. So when my colleague, Bob Kahn, came to visit me at Stanford University in the spring of 1973, he said, we have a problem. We have these three different kinds of networks. How can we connect them together and make them look transparent to the computers that were on each of the nets? That was the internet problem. We solved the problem with the design of TCP IP in about six months. We wrote a paper which was published in May of 1974 called The Protocol for Packet Network Intercommunication. And then we began to do the actual design, detailed design and implementation. I have to tell you, the paper that we published in 1974 is being auctioned by a company in New York for $7,500. And when I heard that, I went to my filing cabinet to see if they had any more copies of the paper available. <laughs> I didn't find any, but you can find a copy of that paper on the net if you, uh, if you just search for a protocol for packet network intercommunication. It's already there in PDF form. Okay, so we had those three networks and we had the idea for how we could connect them together. But it wasn't until November of 1977 that we could actually test all of those networks at once, all three of them interconnected. 
So it was very exciting for me. This November 22nd, almost 30 years ago, was the first time we had all three of the networks linked. And I don't know how clear this is, but the packet radio van is uh, over here going up and down the San Francisco Bayshore area. Traffic was flowing through the packet radio net to a gateway that connected that network to the ARPANET, the wireline network that went. Then we went all the way across uh, the, uh, the network, ARPANET, through an internal satellite hop to Norway and then down by landline to University College London. Then we came out of the ARPANET through another gateway into the packet satellite system that went all the way back over the Atlantic to a destination in uh, the eastern part of the US, then all the way across the ARPANET again to a destination finally in Los Angeles. Well, the distance between San Francisco and Los Angeles is about 400 miles. But if you follow the packet, it went 88,000 miles because it had to go all the way up and down twice to get uh, through the system and back. And it worked. Now, if you know anything about software, you know that most of the time it has bugs. And most of the time it doesn't work. So when this actually worked, we were all leaping up and down saying, it works, it works, as if it couldn't possibly have worked. So this is a very important milestone for, uh, for us in this world. Of course, then you fast forward to 1999, and the internet got bigger, and it got more complicated, and it got more colorful. And that's a pretty good description of the internet of today. So the other thing to look at is who's using the net? If, if we were having this conversation 10 years ago, the largest single group of users would have been in North America. But now you can see from this chart that it's the third largest. The biggest group of users is in Asia. And this isn't too surprising because India and uh, uh, China are part of Asia and they have the biggest populations. The next largest group is Europe. Of course, Europe is kind of interesting because they keep adding countries to it, so it keeps getting bigger. <laughs> Uh, but in any case, it's the second largest group on the internet today. Then the third largest is North America, and then comes Latin America here. And the, you see the rest uh, in this list. That's about 1.1 billion users, but it's only 16%, almost 17% of the world's population. So as the internet evangelist at Google, I still have a very, very big job to add five and a half billion more people to the internet. So there's a long ways to go. Let's talk a little bit about the technology which is shaping the internet today. It was designed deliberately to be insensitive to the underlying transmission and switching technology. So when we started the work in 1973, there was no optical fiber. There was very little in the way of satellite communication. There was only experimental radio communication for data. But we knew that we wanted the internet to keep working, to keep absorbing new transmission and switching technologies as time went on. So we said the internet protocol layer should be very insensitive to how the packets are being carried. We don't care if it's over an optical fiber, a satellite link, or a radio connection, or a coaxial cable. The other thing which we deliberately designed into the system is that the packets of the internet layer protocol don't know what they are carrying. So all those packets know is they're carrying bits. The bits get interpreted by the computers at the edges of the network. Some of the bits might be video, some might be audio, some might be a piece of email, or part of a web page, or a piece of Java code. But the packets don't know what it is that they're carrying. They don't know what applications they're supporting. So the internet itself is completely independent of applications. That was important because we didn't know when we were designing this what applications were going to be popular. We didn't even know which applications were going to work. And we didn't want the network to dictate what the applications are. And in fact, I think that was a very wise choice because we've seen all kinds of applications coming up on the network 
And as the bandwidth of the net has increased, as the speeds at the edge and the core have gotten bigger, there have been new applications that the internet can support. So we adopted what we call an end-to-end -end principle that says the network is neutral, it doesn't know what the applications are, anyone who wants to put up a new application on the internet should be free to do that. So when uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin started Google, they didn't have to get permission from an internet service provider or a telephone company or a coaxial cable, uh, cable television provider to put the applications up. They just put it up on the net, connected it up, and said anybody who's interested in uh, looking at the index of the World Wide Web, come and use our service. The same could be said for eBay and Yahoo and Amazon and all the other, uh, Skype and all the other very popular internet service providers. So this end-to-end -end notion and this neutrality of the net is really important for innovation. And we think it should be a high priority for us to preserve that neutrality and to preserve that ability for anyone to invent a new application and put it up. Well, clearly radio is providing mobility in the internet environment. Speed we're getting from DSL and cable. I do have to say, however, that the broadband services that are available today are becoming less and less satisfactory. Most of them are asymmetric. You can pull data in from the net at higher speed than you can push data into the network. And although that has served pretty well for a lot of the applications of the net up until now, as you see things like YouTube and Skype or Google Talk or other things where people are interacting in real time, sometimes with video, you need higher and higher speeds to push data into the net as well as pulling it out. So as users of the internet, we're going to become less satisfied with broadband unless it is symmetric. If you're in the business world today, when you buy broadband service, you get symmetric services. That's a standard, but for the residential communities, it has not been that way. We are going to run out of the existing internet address space sometime around 2011. At the time that the internet was being designed, there was a big debate over how much address space was needed. And in, after one year of arguing, I finally, since I was responsible for this project in the Defense Department, I got to say, Stop arguing, it's 32 bits of address space, that's it, let's get on with it. Now at the time, I thought that 4.3 billion addresses would be enough to do an experiment. <laughs> what I didn't know is that the experiment wasn't going to end. The network just kept growing. So here we are, literally 30 years later, uh, and we need more address space. Uh, so there is a new version of Internet Protocol that was standardized over 10 years ago called IP version 6. It has 128 bits of address space. That's 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses, or 3.4 times 10 to the 38. Now, I used to go around telling everybody, that means that there's enough address space so every electron in the universe can have its own web page. <laughs> if it wants one. <laughs> then I got an email from someone at Caltech, Dear Dr. Surf, you jerk. <laughs> there are 10 to the 88th electrons in the universe, and you're wrong by 50 orders of magnitude. <laughs> so I don't tell that anymore. In any case, uh, it's really important for us to make sure we don't run out of internet address space. So we want to introduce IP version 6 in parallel with IP version 4 so that both of them are running. And no later than 2011, everyone should be able to use either address so we can smoothly move over to supporting the larger address space in the new packet format. Finally, in terms of technologies that are shaping the network, it's very clear that once you create a network that is available to the general public, there will be some people who want to use the net to abuse other people, or they want to interfere with the network's operation just to show they can do it. 
In fact, there are even some companies that want to use the internet for espionage and other purposes. So we need to add more security than we have today. And you can see from this list that high quality authentication is important at many layers in the internet architecture. Confidentiality is extremely important for people who use the network for business purposes or for personal uh, applications. And finally, we need resilience in the network. We need redundant uh, architectures, multiple computers, alternate ways of passing traffic through the network because we're relying on this increasingly for everything we do. And if anything breaks, if it stops working, it's like all the other infrastructure. You don't pay any attention to it until it doesn't work. When the electricity goes out, it's very annoying. When the roads get jammed with traffic, it's very annoying. When the internet doesn't work the way you expect it to, it's very annoying. And increasingly, it has serious economic consequences. So we need to improve the security of the system in all dimensions. This is just a chart that uh, Jeff Houston, who uh, is in uh, Australia, has been using to track the rate at which IP version 4 address space is being allocated by the regional registries here in Latin America, it's LACNIC. Uh, in the, uh, North America, it's ARIN, and there are three others as well. So ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, is expecting to allocate the last block of Internet version 4 address space somewhere around 2011. And so this is simply motivation for moving to IP version 6 as soon as we can. There are a lot of really interesting effects that occur when the uh, internet becomes available to the general public. One of them is that the consumers have now become producers of information. As you see YouTube and blogging and, and people building their own websites, more and more of the users of the internet are becoming the producers of its content. Internet itself, I think, has become one of the most democratizing systems for allowing people both to produce and get access to information. It's more, it makes information more available than any other technology, uh, I think, up until now. Uh, the Internet Society has a favorite expression, it's the Internet is for everyone. And it really is intended to be, but as you can tell from the statistics, we still have a long ways to go for everyone to actually have access to the system. This kind of technology opens up all kinds of new ways of sharing information for educational purposes. We're seeing universities like MIT putting all of their coursework online and making it available for free. And I think it's an interesting advertising idea. Basically, if you go and look at the coursework from MIT, one of two things will happen. Either you already understand it, in which case you have adva the advantage of free access and you don't need to go to MIT. On the other hand, if you don't understand it, MIT is saying, you need to come here to MIT. Here's the material, but we'll teach you what it means. Uh, there are lots of other possibilities in this online environment for changing the way we deliver educational information and experiences. There are new business models that are emerging out of the Internet's economics. Just to give you a very simple example, uh, of the economics of digital information. Um, in 1979, I remember buying 10 megabytes of disk storage in a box that was about the size of a shoebox for $1,000 US, 10 megabytes. A few months ago, I bought a, a terabyte of information for $1,000. And I know you can get it cheaper now. There's, there's some people jump up and say, well, I got my terabyte for $300. I know, I went to the wrong store. Um, so uh, I, then I thought, well, I wonder what would have happened if I had tried to, to buy a terabyte of disk storage in 1979. And if you do the arithmetic, it would have cost $100 million. Well, I didn't have $100 million in 1979. And to be honest, I don't have $100 million now either. Uh, but I'm sure that if I had had $100 million in 1979, my wife wouldn't let me use it to buy disk storage. <laughs> she, would have, she would have had better ideas for, than that. But this, the, the um, reduction in the cost of memory 
in the cost of computing capacity and in transmission is really changing business models pretty dramatically. I mean, if you were starting, if you thought, well, I'm going to build a store that's going to sell DVDs and uh, CDs, uh, and I want to have a million labels, you could spend a lot of money putting all the inventory into the store. Then you'd have to replicate the store in order to reach different markets. But if you just put all that stuff on the internet in a big server, you can reach the entire global internet. And the cost is, is minimal compared to what it would take to build stores and make physical copies of all that material. So you can create businesses that could not have existed even a few years ago because of the change in economics. Now, I mentioned earlier that security is a big issue. Once you turn internet-like things over to the public, you have all these risk factors, people that generate spam and viruses and worms. They, they abuse other people on the network. They deliberately put misinformation on the network. They commit fraud. So there are a lot of things that we have to do uh, to teach people uh, what they should or should not do with the internet technology. This is not any different than any other infrastructure. The road system, for example, gets abused all the time. People drive badly, they drink, and then they get in the cars and they drive and they either kill themselves or other people. We can't stop those bad things from happening, but we can say that's socially unacceptable and if we catch you doing that, there will be consequences. We may have to think about the internet and some of its abuse the same way. We can't stop you from doing that, but if we catch you, there will be consequences. Let me say one other thing about innovation in the network. I believe that the internet has dropped the barrier to constructive contributions to zero. And I'm going to use Wikipedia as the example. Suppose that you pull up a paragraph from Wikipedia and you found one word that should be changed and, and you are expert so that you know that that one word will, if you change it, that that one word will be beneficial to everyone reading that paragraph. You would never publish a paper with one word in it and you wouldn't publish a book with one word in it. But you can make that one word change to Wikipedia and make a contribution. So really, you could contribute one word, a whole paragraph, a paper, or a book through the internet. That whole range of contributions is made possible. The barrier to sharing information is zero. And I think that's a very important uh, transformation of the information universe for all of us. And finally, I would observe that people use information differently in one culture to another. The style of searching the network varies. The kinds of information that is important will vary from one locale to another. Local information is very valuable, but it's different from one locale to another. So localization of information is becoming very important in the Internet as well. I've already mentioned mobile several times, so I don't want to overstate this, but there are a lot of them. There may be as many as three billion mobiles in the market by the end of this year, and they are not just telephones. They are clearly programmable devices. I have a little BlackBerry here. Uh, it can do short messaging. It can do payments. Uh, I have to admit that it is a challenge. Uh, if you're a, an internet service provider, an application provider, this display is about the size of a 1928 television set. The data rates that you can use to reach this device vary from a few tens of kilobits to hundreds of, of kilobits per second. And the keyboard is suitable for people that are three inches tall. <laughs> So if you're Google or Yahoo or one of the other application providers, uh, we really have to work hard to make these devices conveniently useful. Uh, but they are becoming extraordinary because they are an information portal. We can reach the entire world of Internet information through these mobile devices. And because we carry them around on our persons, Information which is of geographic importance is becoming very, very valuable. 
Uh, let me give you an example. I was on a vacation in May of this year in the middle of the United States. There's a big lake called Lake Powell, and it's in the state of Arizona. And my friends and I were going to rent a houseboat, and we were going to go out on the lake. We knew that we wanted to make some nice meals, and so we planned to make a paella. And we knew that we needed saffron as part of the ingredients, but we didn't have any as we drove into this little town of Page, Arizona. So I got out my trusty Blackberry, and I did a Google search to find grocery stores in Page, Arizona, and I found one uh, with a phone number and an address and a little map. So I called on the phone, again with the Blackberry, and a person answered and I said, may I speak with the spice department, please? Now, you can imagine this is a very tiny little store. I think it was the owner who said, this is the spice department. <laughs> uh, and I said, do you have any saffron? And he said, yes. So we used the map and we drove in. This is all happening in real time. In about five minutes, I got to the store and I went in and I bought my 0 0.06 ounces of saffron for $12.99. And then we got on the houseboat and we made a wonderful paella. Uh, so the point here is that I got information through this little device uh, in real time that was extraordinarily useful to me and it was geographically important that the store I found was nearby as opposed to discovering I could get saffron in Washington DC which was 2,000 miles away. This value of, of geographically indexed information is becoming increasingly apparent. We can see it at Google when people use Google Maps and Google Earth to display information that they have about what's going on in particular geographic locations. And so we're seeing more and more of this, not just in the uh, consumer community, but in the scientific community. Scientists who are collecting seismic information or atmospheric information or uh, biological hazard information are using things like Google Earth to present the information about the sensor networks that they are working with as a way of, uh, of a sort of um, uh, correlating the information coming from distinct and separate sources. The other thing which has really surprised me over the course of three decades is the kinds of devices that people are connecting to the internet. I guarantee you that in 1973, it never occurred to me that someone would connect a refrigerator to the internet. <laughs> or a picture frame. People have picture frames that are internet enabled. When you plug them in, they download imagery from a website on the internet, and then they display the pictures one after the other. So if you have a digital camera, you can upload pictures of the children and the nieces and the grandchildren, and other family members with these picture frames, get the pictures and can display them. So the grandparents really like this. They don't have to log in. They don't have to run Windows or, or uh, you know, OS 10 or anything. Uh, they just get to see what's going on in the family every morning. Now, those of you who are interested in security will appreciate that if the website that is uh, providing the imagery is hacked by someone, the grandparents may start to see pictures that they hope are not of the grandchildren. <laughs> uh, and so security is really important in applications like this. Uh, there are things that look like telephones, but they're really voice over IP devices. And then there's this fellow in the middle of the picture who invented an internet-enabled surfboard. He was, he's from San Diego, California. He's sitting on the water waiting for the next wave, thinking, well, while I'm waiting, I could be surfing the internet if I had a laptop. <laughs> so he built a laptop into his surfboard and he put a Wi-Fi hotspot back in the rescue shack on the beach and he's happily surfing the internet while he's waiting for another chance to ride the waves. He now sells that as a product. So I predict that there are going to be billions of devices on the internet some of them, like refrigerators and uh, the, the, uh, the picture frames, or even, there's even a, an internet-enabled washing machine that sends you an SMS when the washing is done, so you can go in and move it to the dryer. I don't have time to go through all of these little applications, but uh, one of my favorites is the internet-enabled socks. 
Now, you, you know when we send astronauts up, they wear instrumented clothing so we can keep track of their vital signs. So I got to thinking, well, what would happen if all of our clothes were internet enabled? You know, what could you do? And I said, well, if my socks were internet enabled, I could send uh, uh, an SNMP packet to the sock drawer and ask it, you know, what's the state of the sock drawer? And I'd get back a report saying there are 17 matched pairs of socks, except sock number 144L is missing. <laughs> and so I would send a multicast message around the house on the Wi-Fi system, and I'd get back a message saying, hello, this is sock 144L. I'm under the sofa in the living room. So we just solved the problem of the missing sock, which is a huge contribution to society. Now, some of you probably have entertainment equipment at home, and you have remote controls for them, and sometimes a half a dozen or more of these things. And if you're like me, you fumble around trying to figure out which remote goes to which device, and when you finally figure it out, that's the remote with the dead battery. So I have a proposal for you. Let's internet enable all of the entertainment equipment. Let's internet enable our mobiles. And let's use the internet as a way of controlling and interacting with our entertainment equipment. Now the nice thing about that is that it works not just in the room with the equipment, but it works anywhere in the house. In fact, it would work anywhere in the world that you can get access to the internet. Now, of course, that means everyone else could have access to your entertainment equipment. The 15-year-old next door could reprogram your house while you're on vacation. So once again, strong authentication is going to be important to make sure that only the people you want to authorize can have access to your entertainment system. But at least we'll get rid of all those darn mobile uh, or remote control devices and replace them with internet-enabled mobiles. Now, I, I haven't got time to dwell deeply on any of these topics, but this is to remind you that despite the fact that the internet research started over 30 years ago, almost 35 years ago, we still have a whole lot of work to do. And some of this work is worthy of master's and PhD level uh, research. Security, for sure, requires a lot of work at all layers in the internet architecture. If you know anything about telephones, you know that a man named Erlang figured out what the statistics were of telephone calls. The average length of a call is three minutes. There's a nice bell-shaped curve for short and long calls. We don't have any kind of statistics like that for the internet because the range of applications is so broad. You could be clicking on the mouse, sending very few bits per second, and then all of a sudden, a 100 megabit file transfer happens, or a streaming video starts. So the dynamic range of the applications and bandwidths on the network is huge compared to simple telephony. Big problem. Quality of service on the internet generates huge debates. Do we really need, do we need special mechanisms to control the internet quality, or do we just build enough capacity so that everything works? Personally, I'm on the, on the side of just building more capacity because building in QoS mechanisms, I think, is really complicated, and in the end, uh, you, 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 know, you really get a cheaper um, solution to the problem by just increasing the total capacity of the system. So, I, I, As I say, I can't go through all of these in, uh, in detail. But let me just mention one other rather interesting problem. Uh, we don't do a very good job of handling multi-homing in the internet. If you're connected to more than one internet service provider for reliability, right now you end up with two internet addresses. It would be nice if you didn't have that problem. If you're moving in uh, the uh, uh, mobile world and, and you connect to the net at different moments on different uh, base stations, you get different internet addresses we should try to find a way to fix that. Uh, we don't make use of broadcast very well. In fact, we take most broadcast media and turn them into point-to-point -point connections in the current internet architecture. We should be really taking advantage of the fact that broadcast lets you deliver the same information to a large number of destinations very, very inexpensively instead of delivering multiple copies to everyone. So the protocols of the internet 
should evolve in order to support many of these kinds of applications. When we look at the world through Google's eyes, uh, one of the things that is very troubling for us is the weakness of our ability to index the Internet's contents. Today, almost all the searching is based on matching strings. There's a, this word is present on this web page, and so we will note that in the index. But we don't have any clues about the semantics of the meaning of the information that we're indexing. Let me give you an example. If you were looking for uh, the word jaguar, it's ambiguous. It could be a car or it could be an animal. And if you say, if you just search for jaguar, all we can do is tell you here are all the web pages that have the word jaguar in them. If we knew that you were interested in the animal, and if we knew that the reference to jaguar on this web page was in reference to an animal, we could give you a better response because we would suppress the pages that talked about the cars. Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, talks about the semantic net and the semantic web. He's very interested in finding ways to inject semantics into the system and I personally encouraged him to keep working on that and I would encourage you, if you're interested, to consider it because it's a hard problem. But if we find a way to put semantics into the system, we'll be able to index the information much more effectively. We have other problems because it's easy to index the text, but it's very hard to index video. It's hard to index audio. Please find me an image that looks like this. This is hard. Find me a sound or a, a small a snippet of, of music that sounds like this. We don't have good tools for doing those kinds of, of uh, indexing and searching. What about a big database? This database is sitting here with all kinds of information in it, but it doesn't show up as web pages. The database is not in XML, it's in, it's in database formats. And so it doesn't show up in the web crawling that Google and others do to index the World Wide Web. Is there some way that we can characterize the contents of a database so as to direct attention to it when you're doing a search for certain kinds of information. We don't have good solutions to that problem. Uh, we already know that time is a really useful way of organizing information. For example, you might read your email, most recent email first. Uh, in terms of geographic uh, location is another good way of organizing information and we see that in Google Earth where you can zoom in on a particular location and put layers of presentation information on top of that, saying this is what we know about that location. What other kinds of organizing paradigms might be useful? One of them, which is emerging right now from the social networks, is people as a way of organizing information. Your personal universe of friends imposes or induces an organizational structure on information that you care about. You want to know where are your friends now or what are they doing, uh, what kinds of, of activities are planned around that universe of close friends and family. So people may become another indexing model. And then uh, there's another major problem which is just beginning to get attention. Let me try to give you the uh, simple uh, description of this problem. It's the year 3000 and you are searching the net and you get back a hit in the search and it has a 1997 PowerPoint file. So the first question is, does Windows 3000 know how to interpret a 1997 PowerPoint file? And the answer is probably not. And by the way, that's not a criticism of Microsoft. Even if it were open source software, the likelihood that an open source software package a thousand years from now knows how to interpret the bits from a 2007 or a 1997 file is pretty low. So the problem we have is that we can accumulate all this digital information. We can create vast archives of it we can store it away on new uh, high-density technologies. We can move the bits from one storage technology to another. 
but can we interpret the bits? That's the question. What do we have to do to preserve our ability to understand the bits in our digital universe? Do we have to save copies of the application software that knows how to interpret the bits? The answer is probably yes, because there's no guarantee that someone will go to the trouble of mapping the bits from one application to another. And in fact, that may not be possible. It may be that there isn't any new application that knows how to interpret the older uh, formats. Uh, do we need to preserve the operating systems that ran the applications that knew how to interpret the bits? The answer may be yes. Do we need to emulate the computers that ran the operating systems that run the applications that interpret the bits? And the answer may be yes. We have some work to do, and I can tell you that the digital librarians of the world today are becoming very concerned about preserving the meaning of the bits that we're accumulating. Failure to do that leads to what I call bit rot. The, the bits are there, but they are not interpretable. They're, they might as well be rotten because we can't do anything with them. So that's a big problem that we have to solve. Now, it, do I have a few more minutes uh, to, that I can, I wanted to introduce one more topic to you. Uh, I'm going to skip past this. Uh, I, I want to give you a report on what's happening to a project to expand the operation of the internet across the solar system. Now, I don't want you to leave the auditorium thinking that Google's business model is to take over the solar system because that's not, the, that's not Google's business model. This is a project that I've been working on for about 10 years at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California with the support of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency and NASA. Uh, you know that we've instrumented planet Earth pretty thoroughly. We have satellites in orbit, we have sensors on the surface of the Earth and under the water and on the water, and we've been instrumenting Mars as well. We have orbiters in place, we have landers in place. We've been using something called the Deep Space Network, which has these big 70 meter dishes uh, in three places around the world, uh, Madrid, Spain, Canberra, Australia, and Goldstone, California, to communicate with spacecraft that are in orbit around the planets or maybe are blasting past the asteroids. Some of these systems are on the surface of the planets. For example, the 1997 Pathfinder that landed on Mars and sent back lots of pictures. And more recently, the rovers, two of them that are on Mars, that landed in 2004, uh, one, uh, they're on sort of opposite sides of, uh, of Mars. One is spirit and one is opportunity. They've just survived a huge, uh, many week long sandstorm that uh, it didn't, the, the sand didn't harm the physical equipment, but it prevented the sunlight from being converted into electrical power by the solar panels. In fact, we were very, very nervous that uh, these solar panels that look like you know, black wings here on the uh, rovers, that, uh, that they would in fact not be able to produce enough electricity to recharge the batteries. And we were afraid that after the sandstorm was over, the rovers wouldn't wake up because their batteries hadn't been adequately recharged. In fact, uh, not only did it survive the sandstorm, but these devices have lasted for almost three, more than three years now they were originally intended to last for 90 days. And the reason that we thought that they wouldn't last much longer than that is we thought that the dust uh, on the planet would settle on the uh, solar panels and make them less and less effective over time until finally, after a long Martian night, uh, the rover wouldn't wake up because its battery hadn't been recharged. Now, in fact, the solar panels have been kept cleaner than we expected. You know, personally, I think there's somebody up there dusting them off. <laughs> but we haven't caught them on the video yet. So the real reason that they've stayed clean is that there are little dust devils that blow the dust off of the solar panels. And if you go into the control center uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, when one of these little dust storms happens, you can see the voltage level jumping up as the solar panel gets cleaned off. 
So these things have lasted much longer than we expected. There are a number of orbiters around Mars already. The most recent one is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. When the, when the rovers first landed, the plan was that they would transmit data directly back to Earth from the surface of Mars using the big deep space network. But the radio on the rover turned out to overheat after about 20 minutes of use. And so they had to turn it off to keep it from damaging itself. So the duty cycle, the frequency that they could use this radio, went way down. The data rate that it could support <clears throat> was about 28 kilobits per second, which is pretty low. So the, uh, uh, the uh, engineers at the JPL said, why don't we restructure the communications and use a different radio that goes at 128 kilobits per second, but it didn't have enough power to get all the way back to Earth. But it did have enough power to get up to the orbiters. So they started transmitting the data up to the orbiters, which stored the data until the orbiter got around to transmit the data back to Earth. The orbiter's radio operated at 128 kilobits a second, and it could reach all the way back to Earth. So now, all the data that's coming from the rovers is going store and forward through the orbiters. Well, store and forward is the way the internet works. And so, 10 years ago, <clears throat> my colleagues at JPL and I said, why don't we design an interplanetary system that works the way the internet does so that we could have much more flexible networking in space than just point-to-point -point links. So we said, well, let's, why don't we try using the standard internet protocols? <clears throat> that lasted, that idea lasted about a week. And then we realized that there was a problem. The distance between the planets is literally astronomical. <laughs> and, and, you know, when the Earth is closest to Mars, it's still 35 million miles. And at the speed of light, it takes about four minutes for anything to be transmitted over that distance. And if, when we're farthest apart, it's 235 million miles. That's 20 minutes one way, 40 minutes round trip. Can you imagine using the standard internet protocols with a 40 minute round trip time? You know, click, and then you go out to lunch and have a couple of <laughs> Now I know there are probably some networks right here that have the same problem. <laughs> but but in, in this case, there's nothing we can do about it because of the speed of light limitations. There's another problem that shows up too. It's called celestial motion. You know, suppose you're talking to a rover on Mars directly. Mars has this annoying habit of rotating on its axis. And so, you know, eventually the rover is on the other side and you can't talk to it anymore, so you have to wait until it gets around. This is, this is a disruptive kind of communication environment and it's a very highly delayed environment. The TCP IP protocols are not well suited to that kind of operation. Flow control, for example, uh, in the uh, TCP is real simple. When you run out of room, you say, stop. And if it takes a few tens of milliseconds for the other guy to hear you say, stop, that works OK. If it takes 20 minutes before he hears you say, stop, it doesn't work because all the data keeps coming and it's falling on the floor. It just gets worse when you get to the outer planets that are hours away at the speed of light. So we had to, divide, uh, design, we had to design a whole new set of protocols that kind of behave more like email. You know, when you send an email to someone, you don't know if they're online or not and you don't care because it's held in the mail server until you come back online and say, hi, I'm ready to receive the data. So we've designed a whole new set of protocols that we call delay and disruption tolerant networking. The DTN protocols <coughs> uh, were originally designed for this interplanetary system and then we realized that there are problems like this, delay and disruption, uh, here, terrestrially. Uh, we wound up testing this in a civilian application as well. There's a group of people in, living in the northern part of Sweden and Norway and Finland and Russia called the Sami. They're the, they're the reindeer herders 
and they've lived in that area for 8,000 years. But they're so far north that things like satellite communication don't, don't work very well for them. The satellite antenna is literally down on the horizon trying to look out to a synchronous satellite. During the winter months, the villages are very isolated. So we said, well, why don't we put Wi-Fi hotspots in the villages and let's put laptops with Wi-Fi antennas in them on the backs of the snowmobiles and, and the uh, four-wheel drive vehicles. And then as they go from village to village, we'll use the DTN protocols to dump off email or pick up data and take it from one place to another. So we tried that two summers ago and it worked. And we're going to do a multi-village test now uh, next summer uh, in the area. So we're seeing the DTN has some applications terrestrially. And it's kind of ironic that an interplanetary system turned out to be useful right here on planet Earth. So what we're hoping to do over time is to provide a rich networking environment for manned space exploration. Eventually, we'll be going to the other planets. I hope we have nice places to live because the plant, most of the environments there are pretty hostile. Uh, in the long term, though, what we're expecting to do is to standardize the interplanetary protocols so that every time you launch a new mission, any of the previous missions whose assets are still available can be used because of the compatibility, can be used to support the new missions. This is kind of what happens in the internet today. When you connect your computer in, it can talk to 400 million other machines because of the standardization. So we're not trying to build an interplanetary backbone and then hope that somebody comes. That's not the idea. The idea is that as each mission gets launched, we accumulate an interplanetary backbone from the missions that are continuing to operate over time. And so over the next several decades, we hope that this new architecture will create an interplanetary backbone that can be used for space exploration, both in robotic and manned forms. Well, that's all the formal remarks I have for this morning. Let me thank you for allowing me to take this much of your day. I appreciate the chance to talk, and I hope to see you on the net. <laughs>